back-to-back -back wins in the Premier League. Your captain scoring a header at the Barkley end on his 30th birthday. And moving off the bottom of the Premier League table, it couldn't have got much better as the Dean Smith era got underway for Norwich City, but it maybe wasn't all plain sailing. Welcome to the latest edition of the Pinkin.com Norwich City podcast in association with Future Radio 107.8 FM, where we're very pleased to be looking back on a 2-1 win against Southampton after an extremely busy, hectic, lively, emotional roller coaster of an international break. Dave Freezer here alongside Paddy Dabbit and Adam Harvey. Pad, uh, do you think I've just about summed up that fortnight with barely skimming the surface? If we were to get into the minutiae on what's gone on since Brentford, I think we'd be still here at midnight. <laughs> Bearing in mind this has just gone seven o'clock on uh, Saturday evening. So, yeah, no, it was uh, almost surreal now looking back at it all. Uh, yeah, my mind goes back to which was the last Norwich game, obviously, prior to this afternoon. Um, little did we know at the final whistle then what was to unfold in a quite a calamitous manner for Daniel, but... Uh, Unleashing a chain of events which has brought Dean Smith to Norwich and now a second consecutive Premier League win and in a fashion which I think we were trying to work it out on the way back from the stadium back to Arch and HQ the last time Norwich came from behind in the Premier League many seasons ago. So, yeah, he's he's certainly setting himself a high bar if he's going to maintain this level of uh, drama and ultimately positive results and the manner they achieved it and his role within it, which we'll get into in due course, but... It was by no means plain sailing, but him and his assistant, Craig Shakespeare, could deconstruct that in real time and came up with the answers. And uh, the second half was Cara Road at its best, really, on and off the pitch. We'll get into the full details of it as we go, but those full-time scenes, Adam, were pretty memorable, really, weren't they? And what did you make of the way that Smith sort of reacted to it all? Obviously, completely different to, to Daniel Farker, where he got the waves and all of that jazz, which yeah. is, uh, I think it was much more sort of... I think he was just taking in the surroundings and sort of the atmosphere and the fans' reaction to what was quite a memorable win in his first game. I think the excitement and the buzz around the stadium, I hadn't seen that like that for, I wouldn't even want to hazard a guess, obviously probably pre-lockdown. Mm. I think that's probably the last time I'd seen Caro just that sort of roar when that header went in the back of the net was, was next to nothing that I can remember for a long, long time. It was uh, it was spot on, and yeah, I, I suppose he was just soaking it in a, a little bit, wasn't he, rather than getting overexcited, but... I liked that he kept his his calm there. He wasn't. He didn't seem to go too mad after the goals either. Really, I mean, maybe the second one a bit a bit more animated, but certainly the equaliser it was just sort of a a bit of a sort of small fist pump of the air almost, wasn't it? From both him and Shakespeare, they weren't getting over the top because they are still nineteenth. This is still very much the the beginning, and I know it's boring and it's almost talking a bit like the players take it a game at the time and stuff, but. You know that there is a heck of a lot of of hard work ahead of them, and and I just said this to you as we left the stadium, didn't I, Pad? That almost it feels like I'm probably pleased that they didn't get the third goal because that probably probably would have flattered them, given that Theo Walcott definitely could have snatched a, a draw in injury time and really spoiled the party. Yeah. But this is it's unavoidable. It's just that first building block, isn't it? Yeah, and I think if you're as experienced as Dean Smith and Shakespeare, then you know that to be the case. And they won't be fooled by ultimately how that game finished in terms of a win and the manner they achieved it. By you know the first half, there was there was some alarming signs again of of kind of the vulnerability, more so without the ball. But you know even going forward, they didn't bar the goal. Um, they didn't really offer too much more more in terms of an attacking threat. Um, which makes it all the more remarkable that we've seen that sadly with with Daniel in the previous eleven games, and he didn't seem seemingly have the the ability to alter what he was seeing in front of his eyes. And you know, said to Adam uh, as we left the ground today, would Daniel have seen what Dean Smith and Craig Shakespeare saw and took action as he did at half time? I, I have to say, I probably don't believe on the evidence of what we saw with Daniel during games that. He wouldn't have maybe made those changes and ultimately would have Southampton come out and been as dominant as they were in the first half, probably got a third goal and then it was game over. So, you know, that's maybe been very harsh, but, but ultimately what today might show is why Stuart Webber has gone out and A, got rid of Daniel Farker and B, brought in, in his view, a Premier League proven head coach who can, who can make the difference because there's no doubt he did make the difference today. And uh, as I say, you know, There'll be many Norwich fans in that stadium today who've left with a renewed belief that maybe the they can possibly 
defy all those doom mongers who, who have say, basically said they're here for the jolly and have accepted their fate and they're, they're trooping back to the championship. Um, not on the, on the evidence of that second half, definitely not. Mm. And Craig Shakespeare was very loud on the on the sidelines as well, wasn't he? And maybe that first half, it felt like they were just sort of absorbing a lot of stuff. But the tweaks and taking off Campwell and stuff at half time, that said a lot for the new coaching team or the SAS, as I'm certainly calling them from from here on in. Yeah, I mean, Pads has touched on it there in terms of the substitutions. I think Daniel Farker, I naturally would have assumed in a game like that, two on up, he's probably bringing on another central defender. And what did uh, Dean Smith do today? He made a midfield change. So I think that's probably straight away a change that I noticed. And I mean, I could see it on the training pitch when I was up Colney on Thursday. Chase mm. is very involved in the team sessions, much more than probably any of Daniel Farker's uh, previous backroom staff. And even Dean Smith, to an extent, seems to be getting involved in the in the training sessions much more than Daniel Farker, who often just stood on the side and kind of observing. So I think they're much more involved with the players and I think that will probably help Norwich in their mission to, to try and stay in the Premier League. Yeah, and now... Uh, I won't reflect too much on everything that has gone on uh, during the break, but um, of course, Pink and YouTube channel, Pink and audio feed. We've got the interviews with Stuart Webber, obviously Dean Smith from their press conference on Wednesday. Um, so, you know, make sure that you, you go and find all that sort of stuff. But let's stick to this game. And to start with, the three changes, Pad, um, Campwell, Hanley and Gilmore all come in. Omar Babadeli is on the bench, Lise Malou as well, and Dow misses out because he's he's got COVID diagnosis, although they're saying he hasn't got any symptoms at the moment, aren't they? So hopefully they'll get him uh, back into training uh, as soon as possible. And I wouldn't have thought that means he's got to miss sort of 10 days or anything at the moment. It'll be a case of him returning negative tests and stuff, won't he? But um, yeah, so th- those three changes, those three initial decisions, how do, how do you think they uh, played out? And you well, maybe a little bit surprised at, at kickoff? No, actually, I don't want to blow my own trumpet, but that was the 11 that I put in print today. Oh, right, well, there's Charlie. the answer. Then. So, yeah, and, and did a bit of crystal ball gazing, not on the level of Dean Smith, I hasten to add, but I think I think most people reading between the lines could see that Cantwell and Gilmore are probably coming back in because, well, I mean, they eulogised about Gilmore at his opening press conference. Mm. You know, they called him an outstanding footballer and, and the John McGinn anecdote who he had with him at Villa, who obviously was his international teammate. So that looked that looked very likely, and, and I think with Cantwell, the fact that he's trained for the last two weeks, and I don't think it's a secret that you know Villa previously when Dean Smith were there were were very uh, keen admirers, or certainly aware of Cantwell and, and his ability and his potential. So, you know, if you've got a player under your stewardship who, you, who you've liked from afar, then I think um, and within the context of a, a team who have a chronic lack of creativity in terms of goals and output and assists, um, you get him back in the side as soon as you can. And so those two, yeah, made sense, I think, in terms of the selections. Uh, obviously, as it turned out, you know, Cantwell lasted 45 minutes and Dean Smith was honest enough afterwards um, when pushed up the shove to say, look, he was off it, you know, and, and maybe... It was worth the risk, but on reflection, understandable, given that he, you know, up to maybe the last two weeks, we all know how it's played out with him and Daniel Farker, that he wasn't really part of the first team mix and maybe that lack of activity, you know, that was his first Premier League appearance since September the 18th today. That's a huge chunk of time um, to be out of the, the Premier League environment. So ultimately that probably didn't pay off, but um, and Gilmore clearly, you know, second half as Norwich got stronger, he got stronger and he it was his corner that Hanley headed home. Uh, Dean Smith after the, the game called him terrific and a wonderful footballer, a wonderful character. It was a really warm um, eulogy again. So um, so he was very happy with what he saw over, overall from Gilmore. Um, and then Hanley, tough on on Obama Daily, yeah, because he didn't really let anybody down at Brentford ultimately. But for me, looking at it, I felt that if you're going to go Cantwell and you're going to go Gilmore... If you went on Obama Daily as well, are you tilting a little bit too much towards the gamble element, too much towards the inexperience, too much towards the youth? Um, having said on Friday, you know, I need to get my leaders on side. I need to get the experienced players with me on this journey, Smith said. So to me, if you've got your captain who's now fit again and you don't play him, that doesn't really send the right signal. So, yeah, I, I, could, I could see exactly when the team news dropped how he went, the way he went, um, and all the other players, I think they more or less picked themselves, I think. And... Uh, yeah, it, it as we get into it now, it, it didn't look like the best of calls in terms of Hanley in that first half um, <laughs> because, you know, to call him a, call it a rocky display was probably an understatement. But, you know, boy did, boy, did he come to the party in the second half. And again, you know, as we're examining Dean Smith and his calls, 
the big goals he got right, absolutely. Rocky Balboa or <laughs> because in Rocky, the end Rocky he fought Road, back, didn't he? Rocky Road, and I don't mean that lovely uh, piece of confectionery either, but uh, yeah, no, he had uh, he definitely was on the ropes in that first half because <laughs> Jay Adams and uh, Adam Armstrong led him a bit of a merry dance, but it wasn't just him, was it? You know, Norwich were firmly up against it in that first half, but uh, ultimately. <laughs> Such as football, you know, he walks off with the best birthday present you could you could think of. You know, leading his team to a precious three points, and you scored a winner. Roy the Rovers, that on the ropes was exactly where I was thinking. He's uh, he switched back to Southpaw just at the right moment, hasn't he, to rise at the back post um, like a Scottish salmon, as I said in the in the live updates. Um, a bit like Kenny McLean against Manchester City uh, a few years ago. Um, let's talk about that first goal then, and. Uh, Adam, as, as we've already spoken about how good it was at the end and the atmosphere, it certainly wasn't like that <laughs> five minutes in, was it? <laughs> well, it was not the not the ideal start for Dean Smith. Obviously, it's come from sort of a bit of a flick and, and Hanley and Aaron's between them have, have somehow managed to allow Che Adams to get in and, and obviously bury it in the bottom corner. And I think that sort of raucous atmosphere before the game just went flat straight mm. out straight out of Cow Road. And I was a little bit concerned at that point that, you know, this could eventually, if Southampton went and scored another one, that sort of dream start for Dean Smith would have just vanished and we'd have ended up with a not necessarily a toxic atmosphere but that sort of he talked about that process um, in the pre-match press conference yesterday and I don't know I think Norwich fans sometimes probably wouldn't necessarily buy into a process like that I think they want an instant response and obviously the as we're about to talk, uh, talk about the, the Pookie goal is what obviously brought Caro back to life yeah now b- before we get into the good stuff, we should probably uh, say Connor's not here because he's on family duties this week. Uh, can I just put on record now that he's not allowed back in to Carra Road? Yeah, he's the Jonah. Until they lose a game. Yeah. <laughs> he's the Jonah now, although he was there for Brentford, I suppose. <laughs> but I had a new coat today as well, so we've got to remember all these things, haven't we? Yeah. When things come good, you've got to remember the routines and everything that you did beforehand. So I think what I need to do is give Connor my coat. And we'll balance things out for the Wolves game uh, next weekend at home. But yes, as, as Adam's teed up there, Pad, the, the goal from Pookie just within four minutes levels things up again. And there was a serious amount of relief, which probably fueled them hanging on for the rest of the half. Oh, yeah. Massive, massive moments those were because, yeah, you, you don't get back as instantly as they did. And then that sec- first half pans out as it did, but Southampton get a second, then. It's hard to see, given the the blows they've taken for the most part this season. You coming back even with a new manager and you know renewed belief, uh, but um, what a great goal it was as well. You know, it, in real time he didn't really get a sense of how good that that run was, but also he was he was beyond that near post, and yet he he gets the header in. Now I, I questioned McCarthy letting that squirm through his hands at the near post, and um, you know. He should be doing better, and I felt he should have done better for the winner, actually. So, you know, not the best keeping display I've seen from a, from a visiting keeper. But ultimately, um, it was sourced from Rashid to track him back and turning the ball over. There's a maybe a debate to be had about whether that was a foul. It wasn't given. Aaron's carries the ball 20, 30 yards. Rashid is up on his outside, gets to the byline. You know, these are elements that, in this quest for goals and creativity, you know, Rashid to get into the byline and cutting a ball back for Pookie. I don't think we saw that too often prior to the international break, but f- fine sense of anticipation and even better execution. And four goals, four Premier League goals in 12 mm. Premier League games for that man in a team which were the lowest scorers, I think, in English football uh, going into the game. Um, that really just does underline again, despite the periods where he's been questioned, how absolutely critical team Ibuki is to how this plays out from here because you look across the whole roster in terms of what Dean Smith has in terms of attacking options and he is head and shoulders above any of any of the other contemporaries in that squad in terms of somebody you know if you get the right service to him yeah. he will still score you a goal or two or three at Premier League level and there's not really anybody else in that Norwich squad I'm looking at and thinking you'd have the same confidence so yeah, little elements within the elements that have gone into a win today. But Pookie to get on the score sheet again, first game for Dean Smith. He'll know all about him, I'm sure, but it just reaffirms again what a pivotal player he will be moving forward. Mm, to the point where I'm getting ahead of myself here, but I, I do wonder whether January, that 
is got to be one of the priorities to bring in another person who can actually genuinely push Pookie and kick them on almost Dean Ashton style from 2005. You know, somebody who added that next element of things equally sort of as we talked about a lot in the summer that physical defensive midfield presence to perhaps free Norman a little bit although he actually had a couple of really good defensive moments today didn't he maybe a quieter performance on the whole Norman um, but still I think if you were going to spend a bit of money in January if you were going to play about with things you know theoretically say Sam Byram's fit and you get a 25 million bid for Max Aarons or something and you do that so that you can make a few tweaks because you're close to the survival line or maybe even outside the relegation zone at that point uh, which is realistic as we sit here then that's what I'd like to see because Ida still feels like he needs a loan, probably. Sergeant isn't really looking like a striker. He's a look, he's more effective on the right almost, isn't he? Yeah. Um, but again, I'm, I'm sort of getting ahead of myself. We'll reassess all that as we get um, uh, closer to January and things, won't we? Um, but yeah, the rest of that half, Adam, you know, Hanley, like Pad, teed up, but he had a few bad moments, but he also got for a, a, some, a lot of good blocks. And Ben Gibson just like he was at Brentford, had a, had a very good game, didn't he? Yeah, I thought Ben Gibson was pre- pretty much probably the star performer in that first half. Just, that was, and there was one block where he made where I can't remember if he had the shot from outside the box and he really threw himself to, to block it. And I think he's really starting to show that that sort of Premier League mm-hmm. quality that we obviously knew he had from his Middlesbrough days. And that's why he got an England call up at that point. And I think we're starting to see that he has got that capability to play at this level. Obviously, he joined Burnley for £15 million, mm-hmm. so we all know there's a player in there and I think, you know, he's pretty pretty solid at the back there, especially alongside Hanley, that sort of experienced duo. And I think, you know, maybe today if you'd have put an Omar Daly in there alongside him, maybe we might have potentially have uh, conceded again in that game. I think that experience and just sort of that know-how to defend was, was pretty much spot on today. Yeah, the way Southampton attacked was pretty impressive in that first half. They really piled forward, got bodies in the box, and you can't forget that they had won three, drawn one of the last four games. They were in a real good flow, and you could see they had that confidence. And somehow, Smith and Shakespeare managed to uh, sort of generate that spirit and confidence and momentum within the Norwich dressing room at half time because they looked a totally different team in the second half as as we'll come on to a bit more closely uh, Krull also made a, a, an excellent save to bail out Grant Hanley before half time which was uh, one of the bad moments for, for Grant when he tried to sort of spin on halfway which really isn't his game and took a risk and it backfired and it was a real strong hand from Krull to, to save his team but Campwell um, before he obviously was hooked at half time pad but that first half <laughs> You know, there were two moments, weren't there, where the crowd got on top of him. There was there was one where he sort of tried to win a foul on the edge of the box, quickly realised, no, it can't do that, jumped up, tried to win the ball, and then pretty quickly after he lost the ball on the edge of his box, didn't he? And, and they um, that was, I think, the Gibson block that you're talking about. Um, but there was a lot, of, a lot of blocks in that sort of period of the game, wasn't there? So, yeah, what do you... What do you th- think of Todd's performance pad did we just put that down to rust and almost he's you know you said about Gilmore not playing for a while that was Todd's first game since the end of August and and that did look a very rusty performance didn't it yeah I mean we don't need to go any further than what Dean Smith said that he felt he just wasn't quite at it for for what was required and um, and whereas before the game you weigh up the pros and cons and maybe you come down on the side of we need to get that creativity in the side and what he did, certainly in the first part of the Premier League season two years ago, he can offer you that. So, you know, he weighed it up and felt it was worth going with, but it was very clear something needed to change. Um, and and it was telling, I, I saw it about five, ten minutes from the end of the first half where mm. Shakespeare and, and Smith called Sergeant out of the, the home dugout and they were deep in conversation with him and Shakespeare was pointing sort of to areas on the pitch and then he went off and did a warm-up and I, straight away then you think, right, they've seen enough and they're probably going to change and I thought they might match up Southampton but they didn't necessarily, well, they didn't match up in terms of tactical shape but certainly, you know, half-time whistle reappearing with Sergeant and Cantwell got the hook but... Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't be. I, w- I wouldn't necessarily be too harsh on Todd today. I mean, it was was all, for me. It was going to be a tall order to come into that environment, and then as good as Southampton were as well. You know, if it had been a bit different type of game, if it had been re- roles reversed, and it was Norwich, Norwich's second half, but producing the first half, I'm sure he would have been able to get on the ball and show his quality. So he wasn't helped by the the way the game unfolded. You know, Norwich falling behind early, Southampton. As you say, three wins and a draw going in, full of confidence. That's only reinvigorated him even further, and it wasn't really the the canvas on which he could, you know, paint paint the pictures that we know he can. But there's no doubt about it. He's, by definition, if Dean Smith felt after two two months out 
no, I want him straight into my eleven. He really rates him as a player. So Todd's just got to go away now and keep his head down and do, yeah. what, do what he did last two or three weeks and work hard on training day in, day out. And uh, and he will get opportunities. And there's no doubt over the entirety of this season, because he's too good not to, he will have an impact on Norwich's season. Yeah, he's just got to keep grafting, hasn't he? Not get let this get him too down because it wasn't like he was a disaster. There were a few good flicks and stuff where he reminded us of the things that he can do, um, but just overall he wasn't actually impacting the game. And then defensively, as we saw in the second half, Rashitza also looked a lot better once he was on the left. Yeah. But Sergeant Adam, in terms of how hard he worked to protect Max, because Max kept getting outnumbered on on that Southampton left, didn't he, in the first half? And Sergeant, that definitely worked in terms of just giving someone who could offer more protection. I think that was the perfect substitution. Obviously, you know what Sergeant is. He's, he's a hard-working player who he's going to get back, he's going to track back. And I think we saw that. He just offered that sort of little bit more on that side, which obviously Campwell wasn't necessarily offering in the first half, where we were getting hugely exploited by their full-backs. And... I think had we have not made that change, I think that probably would have been more of a, a different second half to what we actually got. I think mm. that sort of defensive structure almost by having Sargent there was, was much more resolute and it allowed us to break forward in numbers a bit more where I think in the first half it was just with amount of times it was being cleared and Puki was up there alone and so mm. he's not see it kind of felt a little bit like that Leeds game where it was just lump it clear, but obviously more of just in a defensive nature they were doing it. But yeah, I think that was the the ideal substitution and I think as we've already talked about, I think that's one thing Dean Smith already I can just notice from what he's brought into the club is he knows how to make a substitution and when to make it. Mm. Yeah, which is is good to see. There were there were a few moments today when it was the crowd got into it because of sort of fifty fifty moments, didn't they? Like Pookie closing down Salisu, I think it was, Sergeant charging back to get goal side of Walker Peters, I think, after he'd I think he'd lost the ball as well. Quite a few of that Norman sliding into to win a tackle. They're the sort of things that get a team uh, get the crowd on side, don't they? And they were really into it that second half. What did you make of Rashitza as well, Adam? Because I gave him my man of the match, but I, I don't think there really was a, a big standout player today. But I, I thought that was probably a, another, certainly second half, him building on a pretty decent performance at Brentford. If you can put his first half at Brentford and his second half against Southampton together as a 90-minute performance, you've probably got a top four player. <laughs> I think the Leeds game was when I sort of first started to think he'd maybe have sort of made a few improvements. And then that Brentford game, you spoke about that, that second half, he was he was you know pretty much one of the standout players. And then today, I'd say, you know, Dean Smith obviously... A player that uh, he likes and knew about beforehand, so there's probably that extra element to to try and impress him on the pitch, especially on on a match, a match day. And obviously today he's done that. I think he was getting down. He was actually running at the defenders. Um, obviously you're quite Walker Peters is quite a, quite a fast uh, fullback, so to to be able to beat players like that, he has to has to be on his game. And I think some of his deliveries were pretty much on the money today. If you sort of had someone in the right place, I think we probably could have scored more. So I think he had a, a very good performance, probably his best in an orange shirt so far. Yeah, taken off corners by Billy Gilmore though, uh, because there was one in the first half which I got particularly frustrated with when he just sent it over everyone. It was awful, wasn't it? Curled it far yeah. too beyond everyone. Now, before we talk Billy Gilmore, I'm going to just give you a little clip of Grant Hanley, who I spoke to after the game, because uh, I asked him about Billy, and um, I thought this was a really interesting answer. Lovely delivery from Gil, uh, from Billy. Sorry for from the corner, swinging it into the back post there like that. Have you and Kenny in particular sort of been able to get your sort of arms around his shoulder and sort of keep him calm and stuff when things haven't been going his way? No, I, th- I don't think you need to say much about Billy Gilmore. I think he will play at the top of the top. Yeah. Um, the type of player he is, the ability he's got, you know, his his attitude and his his mentality. I think that you only see that in certain players, and they're the players who play at the top. So there's no doubt in my mind Billy Gilmore will play right at the very top. So. You know, there's not too much you need to say to him. He's, um, you know, he's unbelievable every single day. His mentality, you know, he's never a problem. Even when, obviously, he's had a bit of a tough time not not playing. Um, but he's probably the best player every day in training. Yeah. Every time he plays, he's probably the best player. So, um, no, nothing to say about Billy Gilmore apart from I think he'll do alright. Yeah, he certainly grew into the game, didn't he? Um, but actually, he was supposed to put that corner front post. We overhit it. Really? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm actually sure that gets in. Yeah. Right, Gilmore, Pad. What did you make of him? Because I think at half time he could have, in my eyes, just as easily as Cantwell come off the pitch. I didn't think he was particularly good at all in the first half. Obviously, they went for Cantwell. But there was a little phase towards the end of the first half, wasn't there, when he just started to get the ball in close quarters a little bit, in tight spaces, and they were starting to use him a little bit more. And we were just seeing flashes of, of what he wants to do. But that second half was. Was it his best 45 minutes, do you think? was that? I don't know. I suppose his first half against Liverpool was pretty good on the opening day of the season as well, wasn't it? But overall, a step forward for him, finally. Absolutely, yeah. I I just think what we've seen today is to give Daniel you know, a little bit of 
you know, respite from from why didn't he play Gilmore? Is is the two sides of him? If if they're in a team or playing against a team where they're on the back foot, they don't have a lot of the ball, then he's not going to offer you what you need in those central areas. It's just not his game to to you know offer insurance to the back four. It, it, physically, you look at him, he, he cannot deliver that type of performance. Um, but if they can get on the ball and the intensity drops and Norwich have a little bit more space and time in the central areas, then his, his ability is there for all to see. And yeah, that, that spell in the first half was it was about 30, 35 minutes in and it was almost it was almost like he, it was, he had his own ball for about a minute. Yeah, he was just giving like it, going it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that's because the, the intensity that Southampton had mustered for the previous 34 minutes or so just, just dropped a touch and there was a bit more space in front of their back four. And, and that was even more marked in the second half when Norwich collectively pushed a lot higher up the park, they pressed higher um, and they squeezed the play as well. So the majority of that second half was played in Southampton's half and that is a perfect backdrop for, for Gilmore to show us what he's all about, which is technically a very good operator and obviously the set-piece delivery brought the goal. But I think, as Dean Smith broke it down, it wasn't just the Campwell change. He, he interpreted what he'd seen in that first half as the phrase was that his eights in the middle of the park, so he's talking... McLean, Gilmore, Norman didn't get close enough to their sixes um, in other words their central midfield players they were being allowed to dictate the play and, and and so clearly Gilmore has to take his share of responsibility for what didn't happen in the first half but there's no doubt about it You know, the tactical changes and just that almost putting Norwich onto a front foot setting rather than kind of just constantly chasing the ball as they were and trying to close down the spaces and failing to do it more often than not with Walker Peters, particularly in that first half. Um, it, it just had a transformational impact, not only on Norwich's display, but also Gilmore's as well. And and now the now the key, if you're Dean Smith and Shakespeare, is how can Norwich, what we saw in the second half, that can be their go-to um, sort of approach from minute one in games. Because if, if they could maintain a bit more of the progressive, aggressive type of uh, outlook on, on Premier League games. And I think within that template, we will start to see Gilmore exert a bit more control and give Norwich a bit more composure on the ball. Um, but again, you know, he is now definitely, if Daniel Farker wasn't the head coach, to give him the environment he needed to go and do his stuff and, and try and make that breakthrough in the Premier League. Because ultimately, that's why he's here. He, he's been loaned out from Chelsea because he's essentially a bit part player at Chelsea. He's not getting past Kante. Uh, Jorginho, uh, Kovacic, you know, one or two others in that central midfield for Chelsea. He had to go out and play regularly in the Premier League. And up to this point, it hasn't happened for him. But uh, but he's certainly under this head coach. The warmth with which he's spoken about him pre and post match today, he will get his opportunity between now and January when a potential recall decision would have to be made. But I think it's safe to say if, if he remains in the Norwich side between now and then, then it's a game changer. Yeah, and if he wants to have any chance of being in at Chelsea next year, he's going to have to really make a success of this now because Conor Gallagher's absolutely tearing it up at Crystal Palace, isn't he, in the England squad? I know he's a bit more of an attacking player, but they've sort of got another young darling now, haven't they, the Chelsea fans, who they can get a bit obsessed with. Maybe getting that hype away from Gilmer might help him a little bit. But yeah, he's got to kick on from here because he has got the quality, he has got more to offer, and it's almost about, I don't know, maybe almost building your team around him and, and, and making sure that he's getting enough of the ball to shine because he then creates that chance for Pookie, doesn't he? Which was 76 minute when McCarthy turns that around the post. Timmy did really well with that, to be fair, to create just that little bit of space so that he could smash the shot at the near post. And McCarthy really had to make sure that uh, that went behind. Uh, and then Gilmore obviously uh, delivers the uh, the corner for, for Hanley's header. Um, anyone else, Adam, who really sort of caught your eye today? I thought Brandon Williams had good moments and McLean, uh, particularly second half, was, was full of energy. Yeah, I think we're talking outfield players. I think McLean played a very good performance. Obviously, he's a player I've seen on social media. A few fans are saying, will he actually get chances under Dean Smith? Because he was sort of one of these Daniel Farker players. Mm. But I thought today, you know, because as a few people were trying to say, in the Lays Malou, did he deserve to be dropped after the Brentford performance? But I thought McLean really stepped up to the plate today in terms of outfield players. But I think you've got to give a, another mention to Tim Krull in the, in the mm. goal as well. Because I think without him today, obviously, had that goal of going in, I think that probably would have... Uh, Probably flattened the atmosphere again, and I just don't think we'd have eventually come back again from from behind to to then go and win that game. So I think he also deserves a, a huge shout for just being sort of on it in sort of especially during a surge. He just really, just really sort of kept in the net and uh, and done done his job. Welcome 
to the new normal. Hello, and welcome to this series of Unfinished with me, Charles Thompson. Welcome to Weird Norfolk. Welcome to this week's edition of the Pinkin.com Norwich City Podcast. From true crime to football, politics to folklore, for more great podcasts from Archant, head to audioboom.com forward slash channel forward slash Archant. I think, if I'm remembering this correctly, McLean, it was a really nice McLean pass to Rashitza, which won the corner, which then won the game, of course. Um, and so I, I think Kenny had a, a pretty decent performance after a pretty shaky early few minutes of the game where he lost the ball twice. I mean, he was involved in the build up to the first goal and he conceded that throw in completely unnecessarily, didn't he? The, the, the long throw that was chucked in the box the first couple of minutes. So, um, yeah, I, I would imagine with Dean Smith being the sort of manager he is that he'll probably be similar to Daniel in terms of seeing him as the sort of player who can be a glue the glue in a team who can make others tick and he's he's reliable um if Norwich are to progress further up the Premier League if they're to become a mid-table Premier League team at some point who knows it might still be possible this season maybe they're going to need to sort of go beyond a player of of McLean's quality but I think for the here and now he's probably still got a fairly important role uh, uh, to play but um, we can't avoid it Pad, um, they did live very, very dangerously in injury time, didn't they? And I still don't quite know. I mean, James Ward-Prowse delivery, we all know how good it is, but we got to see it up close today, didn't we? And sometimes when you see a top quality player, you can just you can really tell. I remember I went to watch England play Croatia at Wembley with my dad and I we were sat quite near the, the front of the stand as well. And I, I just watched Modric throughout that game and just oozed class. But the delivery from Ward-Prowse for that was, was just absolutely on the money I ha- I'm pretty confident I could have got that on target I don't know what Walcott was he's probably the last person that Southampton wanted on the ball well you've hit the nail on the head thank <laughs> god it was it I mean thank god Danny Ings is no longer there because yeah. he can guarantee and he has scored headers against Norwich in the Premier League if it had been a, a well even Armstrong or Che Adams I'm pretty sure you know they would have got that on target and that far out with the power they could have generated yeah that would have been a sickness no doubt about it um Still would have been a half decent point, but you know, just that sense of three points gone or two points gone um, could have been very tough to recover from. So, again, you know, it's not all down to Dean Smith and Craig Shakespeare and their tactical acumen. You need a little bit of luck as a manager, and uh, you know, we, I don't think anybody in Norwich persuasion is going to begrudge them a, a dollop or two of that in a minute because there's been precious little of that in the first 11 games. So, um, yeah, big moments, and that was a big moment. And uh, I mean, but Ward Prize is in the England set up, so you know he's in terms of a deliverer of a ball as Deadpool as good as anything probably in the Premier League. So, and that underlines the point. That underlines what Norwich are trying to do because Southampton, despite being in a rich vein of form, uh, are still below mid table. By no means are they one of the leading lights in in the Premier League, and yet they still have players of the class of a Ward Prowse or. Um, you know, Adam Armstrong could have headed to Norwich if Norwich could have put the finances in place in the summer. Um, yet had to prove he's a prolific Premier League scorer. But you know, all these teams that sadly Norwich are probably going to be directly competing with have quality in their ranks, and that's why you know today is a small step, but at least it's a step in the right direction. Yeah, I thought Armstrong was reasonably quiet today. I mean, they they didn't have Stuart Armstrong. Uh, I'm not sure why he wasn't in the team. It might have been illness, if I remember that correctly. Redmond didn't return for them as well, so they ended up uh, being without a, a few people. But, yeah, that's the one thing when you look at the table at the moment, that Norwich have got to drag three teams below them, haven't they? You know, Newcastle, we all know that's a strange situation. They could potentially spend ridiculous amounts of money in, in January, so they're sort of in a... A bit of limbo now, aren't they? And they're two points adrift at the bottom of the table, strangely. But yeah, you're probably, you know, you're looking at Burnley maybe finally running out of steam, Brentford dropping back down. You're going to need to pull some other teams into it. Leeds may be vulnerable, Southampton could be, but I, I think they've probably got enough. I mean, we we heard the um, Southampton local media behind us in the press watch, didn't we? And they were talking about it like it was almost a sackable offence for Hasenhut, or like that it was a real disaster for them to, to lose to Norwich in that way. But at, at least we're not going to have to be talking about that Derby points total pretty surely that they're going to get another three points this season by hook or by crook, aren't they? So um, I, I guess... Looking forward now, Adam, if you're one of those Norwich players, you're absolutely buzzing to get back into training now, aren't you? And to have that full week with Shakespeare and Smith. I think they've obviously 
you know, they, well, that confidence they're going to have from two straight wins in the Premier League, which I can't remember the last time Norris done that. And uh, yeah, I think that was Neil, wasn't it? Didn't they win at West Brom? Southampton as well, wasn't it? Was it oh was yeah, the Christmas period? Villa and Southampton. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and that, and they were six points clear, weren't they? And then that's when they went and bought closer and pinned. That feels like ancient history, doesn't yeah. it? <laughs> there might have been. There wasn't one under Daniel, was there? So. Um, I don't think... Well, if it was, it would have been in that first August, September spell, wouldn't yeah, it? Yeah, because Newcastle Man City went back to back. So I'm pretty sure it was Neil. Um, so it might, yeah, it might even have been that December, January time when they beat Villa and Southampton and it was Vadis a, a Deidre yeah, Afoe yeah, yeah. and all, all that sort of stuff, wasn't it? Um, but, yeah, it's going to be good. So, Pad, in, in terms of sort of wrapping things up, what do you think... Or maybe he even hinted at this in his post match um, that that Smith and Shakespeare will really be focused on as they get out on on the training pitches. I suppose ma- mainly it's just building that confidence and keeping everybody on a bit of a high. Yeah, I mean it's just belief. They need to, they mm. need to. I mean he, he he's we used that word in in the build up since since Wednesday was unveiled and then Friday we you know there was his pre match presser and I think they have made the the right call that there is quality in this squad maybe maybe not comparable to other Premier League teams certainly in the top half of the table the same depth of quality but there is enough quality and they haven't hitherto shown that on a consistent basis because they should be better than where, where they were at the, this stage I think you know much better I don't know you could debate that but um, so the quality if the quality is there then it's about belief and and there's nothing can instill belief in a set of players than winning games and winning it in that fashion as well to come from behind to show that character and that spirit um so it should that result and the manner of it should do wonders for moving into the next week wolves and, and then obviously newcastle at Carrow. that's a big game on the horizon so yeah i think it's just building on that belief building on that confidence levels and and then i think probably that oh, in terms of what they've seen today, I think they'd, they'd clearly want to avoid a repeat of maybe some of the defensive issues in that first half. And that isn't necessarily just at the door of the back four and cruel. I think that's the structure, the shape. It wasn't right. and uh, But that's the beauty of having a full week now. You know, really, I mean, it's remarkable that they've dredged that <laughs> today from essentially probably a session and a half, two sessions at most, because Thursday was the first time they had the players back. And even then on Thursday... I think Norman and Pookie, because they were in a recovery phase, phase sorry, from playing midweek for their respective countries, they didn't take part in training. So probably he's only had the players for one session. Um, and as I say, they've got that result out of them. So a full week ahead, um, they can really build up to now Wolves, which will be by no means an easy you know, test. They seem to be on a nice upward curve. But hey-ho, that's the Premier League every week. It's going to be a tough ask, but uh, they'll certainly not lack for confidence, that's for sure, and hopefully a little bit of momentum, because ultimately, OK, achieved with two different head coaches, but they're now going to Wolves on the back of two Premier League wins in the Premier League. That's a pretty decent seam of form. Well, I can't even imagine when the last time Norwich would have won three on the spin in the Premier League. I, I, that would probably be quite a long time. I can't... There was that 10-game unbeaten run under Hewton, wasn't there? But yeah. I don't remember there being three wins in that one and under Lambert obviously they had good results in, in that first season in the Prem didn't they but yeah. but bad ones along the way as well it was sort of up and down a bit wasn't it so you might even be going back to to the 90s to the glory years and stuff what, like that. what, what Worthy's great you know great escape which then ran out of steam at Fulham but that, that mm. period two months from the end where they went on a bit of a surge yeah I they? think there were back to back wins wasn't there but there was the draw at Palace the 4-3 loss at Southampton yeah, so and probably not three straight so I wouldn't have thought so but I haven't got that in front of me so that that's let's hope that we <laughs> can be thinking about that next weekend uh, I'll maybe dig out that stat just to uh, just to see um, thank you boys for your thoughts thank you very much for listening um, keep it locked pinkin.com this week because there is a lot going on still um, in the build up to the to the Wolves game you might have already seen uh, the story on our websites this morning about the club's modernisation of the crest um, I don't think uh, it's going to be too long before they announce that we don't know exactly when that's going to be but um, the press association sort of let the cat out of the bag a little bit that initially the club had intended to uh, reveal the sort of, I'd say it's a modernisation really. I, I have seen it because there, there's there been a very thorough consultation process going on. Uh, so I saw it a, a couple of months ago actually and uh, while they were in the final stages of it. So it was all, it's all being very carefully worked on and 
as much as we can tell you about it at the moment is on our websites for now and um, I, I don't think it's going to cause too many major eruptions obviously there are some people who just don't like change but it's it's nothing it's nothing too drastic so whether that will get confirmed this week or not I, we'll have to see because it was originally scheduled for the November international break but of course they had other priorities so um, that got pushed back we'll see how um, far away that is um, we've not heard about Stuart Webber's contract yet. He said that would be settled in the November international break. Uh, and we have the AGM coming up on Thursday night. So whether all of that will tie together or it all comes out on the same night, or I don't know. But um, we don't think those things are going to be too far away in the future. So, so as I say, keep it locked on our websites and on the papers and stuff uh, this week. Because um, it's never dull in Norwich City, is it? There's always, always something going on. But it's great that we can reflect on a win and I'm sure from a fan's point of view as well great that as much excitement as there was about the start of the new era today and looking forward to a new game that that's almost going to go up tenfold for the game next week as as much as they probably don't need to win that one now another a a draw on top of this would mean a very very good start to the to the new era but it means everyone can look forward to going back to Carrow Road and, and and travel to the ground with with that bit of hope and and uh, a, maybe a little bit of confidence if the players can keep producing what they were showing in that second half. Thank you very much for listening. We will catch up with you soon.